Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. What a pleasure it is to have you here all tonight to this lecture series on the origins of the Second World War, a cataclysmic event that took cost the lives of some 55 million people and devastated several continents. We chose calling the lecture series Reinterpretations, Lasting Issues of the Second World War. And it's great that so many of you actually showed up tonight, I mean, in this showery Oslo. Um, the main person of the day came here soaking wet because he forgot his umbrella at the Holocaust Center today. <laughs> but he is very courageous, so he is here with us. Um, I want to extend then, of course, a warm welcome to you, Professor Richard Overy, and you will be introduced much more f in detail in short in a few minutes, but let me just explain and say that this lecture almost has the same title as H.P. Taylor's classic famous study from the beginning of the 1960s, Origins of the Second World War, but that is 50 years ago. I do hope that Professor Overy will be as irreverent with regard to the received truths as Taylor was so many years ago and decades ago. Uh, I should introduce the host of tonight. My name is Guri Eltnes. I'm a director at the Norwegian Center for Holocaust and Minority Studies, and I'm an historian. And co-host is Professor Tom Christensen. You will see him in a few seconds. Historian, professor at the University of Tromsø, the Arctic University of Norway. And together we have conceived this lecture series as a collaborative project between the Holocaust Center and the University of Tromsø, with the gender support of the ECPO Foundation. Thank you, ECPO. Without you, or we would not be here, and we would not be here. And if we succeed this fall, maybe something will follow up in 2020. The idea behind is simple. This fall marks 80 years since the outbreak of the Second World War, and next year we will be celebrating the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War, a celebration of the liberation. These two events supply a perfect reason to hold such a public lecture. No more, no less. In Norway, celebrating the end of the war starts this fall, up north in Finnmark in October. And the ending of the war certainly will be a word by celebration in the coming one and a half year all over. And that is actually the idea behind this series. The topics you will see in the folder you have on your seat, taken as a whole, we want this academic series to provide a global point of view. This was a global war, it was just not a Western war. We want to provide an international perspective on the Second World War, and Tom Christensen will speak a little bit more about that. You can see we start with Professor Overy. Next time, that is a Tuesday, the only Tuesday, everyone is a Thursday, is Maria Fritsche talking of the ordinary amidst the external ordinary, encounters between the occupier and the occupied in Europe. In October, Uli Jürgen Mohr, the time of the apocalypse, air power during the Second World War. And then in November, Anton Weisswendt, who is here today, Nazi mass crimes and politics of the UN Genocide Convention. And then ending in December with Deborah Lip Lipstadt, professor at the Emory University, speaking of the Eichmann trial in the context of the other Nazi cri <laughs> war crimes trials. So, we hope to see you again later on. Before Professor Tom Christen will introduce Professor Aubrey, let me share some practical information with you. It's very simple. We proceed with now intermission and conclude latest at 8 o'clock sharp. On this side of the room you will find food and drinks, and you may help yourself during the lecture, but please try to make it silently. And of course, there will be a conversation afterwards and then possible to ask questions and have answers after the lecture, following, of course, by a closing statement by the speaker. Again, most warm welcome to all of you. And Tom, the floor is yours. <laughs> now we go. Thank you. And. Uh, Perhaps I should say a few words about our thoughts when we made up the program, because our main uh, aim was to um, shed light on 
uh, what made the Second World War a very special event, and also what marks it as different from most other wars. So, to put it simply, we are dealing with occupational regimes of various brutality. We are dealing with air power, which started with the uh, air defense system, the Battle of Britain, went on to strategic bombing, and ended, uh, ended with the, the atomic uh, explosion over Hiroshima in 1945. And also, we will address uh, genocide, which is another of those very special and rare uh, uh, aspects of the Second World War. And we will start with Professor Richard Overy, uh, who will address the topic of why war, which is something that both uh, academic scholars and politicians and the public opinion have pondered for 80 years, why war. And it is an exceedingly great honor and pleasure to welcome <coughs> Professor Richard Overy here tonight. As everybody will know, he is among the most accomplished historians of the Second World War. He published his first work in 1973. I know it's quite challenging, but I must be brief in my presentation. But here's a few words. Aubrey was educated at Cambridge, where he held a teaching position from 1972 to 1979 at Queen's College. He then moved on to King's College London, where he taught from 1980 to 2004, from 1994 as a professor of modern history. I should perhaps remind the audience that from the 1970s, the War Studies Department at King's became by far the most prominent institution of its kind, with an overwhelming international reputation. More relevant uh, for this evening's lecture is his concise 1939 Countdown to War from 2009, which is highly recommendable. And I have not mentioned his uh, seminal works on the execution of air power during the Second World War. I shall wisely refrain from that since my word would soon approach extravagance. So with no further ado, the floor is yours. Richard, please. Well, thank you very much for those kind words of uh, introduction. Um, and thank you very much indeed to the Holocaust Center for inviting me to give the opening lecture in this series, which I'm very honored to do. It was quite a challenge to be told that I'm stepping in the shoes of A.T.P. Taylor, who saw and I always admired uh, as I was uh, growing up as a young historian, uh, and you will judge by the end whether I've succeeded in doing so. I want to start off very briefly by reminding us about some of the ways in which the outbreak of war in 1939 has been interpreted, and I want to go on to explore uh, a variety of different ways in which we might explain it. For a long time, the assumption always was that the invasion of Poland was part of uh, Hitler's plan for world domination. One state after the other uh, would fall into the German lap. And Poland was just the next one after Czechoslovakia and Austria. That There was some grand plan um, which was generated in Germany. And indeed, that was the argument, of course, presented at the Nuremberg trial in 1945-46. The second thing is that for a long time, the idea has persisted that Hitler wanted war with Britain and France in 1939 and deliberately provoked them into war so that he could have his war in the West before perhaps waging some kind of war in the East. And indeed, that's an argument which has persisted to the present day. The third argument is that Hitler was pushed into war because of economic crisis. 
the German economy was so fragile, facing all kinds of pressures and difficulties, that the working class was becoming increasingly restless, and that Hitler in the end decided that war would be a way out. This would be an option that would solve his economic problems and quieten down the working class. Now, all of those are interesting arguments, but I will show, I think, today that almost none of them have stood the test of time. We need to approach the outbreak of war, I think, in a very different way. The first thing, I think, to emphasise is the place of Poland in Hitler's thinking. There was no plan for war. Poland was not on Hitler's list in the 1930s. In fact, quite the opposite was the case. For a long time, uh, Hitler and the German leadership in the 1930s believed that Poland would gradually gravitate into uh, the German orbit, that Poland would become a kind of satellite state, as Slovakia became, or Hungary and Romania later on became, anti-Soviet, perhaps a stepping stone to an eventual war uh, with the Soviet Union. What Hitler wanted, of course, was for Poland to accept uh, revision of the Treaty of Versailles, just as he wanted the Czechs to accept it, that they would abandon Danzig and it would become a German city again, that the corridor would suddenly become uh, German territory once more, that they would voluntarily give up Silesia and its rich industrial resources, which Poland had won in 1920. Poland, of course, very sensibly refused because they could understand what the implication was of becoming a satellite of the new German power. And it was that refusal, the realisation on Hitler's part that Poland was not going to play the role in his vision of Eastern Europe that he'd hoped for, uh, that he decided on war. In early April 1939, he called his generals together and asked them to prepare a campaign against Poland in the autumn, a short, sharp campaign uh, which would defeat the Poles. The Poles suddenly became for Hitler a mortal enemy, which they were not in 1938. Um, German propaganda played up, played up all the terrible things the Poles were doing to the German minority living in Poland and so on and so on. Um, Hitler, Hitler searched around for a casus belli so that he could find a justification for his war with Poland. Now, if Poland had not been his initial aim, uh, certainly in the course of 1939, uh, Poland became uh, the victim uh, in Hitler's view. But there are a number of other factors we need to consider in explaining Hitler's decision to turn to war against Poland in 1939. The first is to remember what had happened with the Czech crisis in 1938. There's no doubt that Hitler wanted a small war in the late 1930s. He said it. He wanted his army to be blooded. Uh, the army wouldn't... It was no point in having all this rearmament if the army didn't do something. Um, he'd wanted a small war against Czechoslovakia, planned in the spring of 1938. And he didn't get it, and he was deeply frustrated. He was also conscious, and I think it's a point we often forget, as he looked around at his potential allies, that Japan and Italy had had their small wars. Japan had conquered Manchuria and was now at war with China. Uh, Italy had conquered Ethiopia. In fact, by the time the war against Poland broke out, the German armed forces had not been engaged uh, in violent conflict throughout the 1930s. And throughout 1939, Hitler was clear that he doesn't want another Munich. He doesn't want anybody to rein him in. He wants to be able to have his small war against the Poles, and he's convinced that he can make that war localised. The other thing to emphasise, I think, is Poland as living space, Lebensraum. Now, there's nothing new, of course, about the idea of Lebensraum. We all know about it. it was, uh, it's featured in most books about uh, German expansion in the 1930s. But it's very seldom put into context. What did it mean? What did it mean uh, for Hitler? And I want to argue tonight that one of the things we're missing out when we think about Germany's 
war on Poland as the imperial paradigm that Hitler adopted in the 1930s. We're so used to thinking that the war against Poland is about reversing Versailles, ending uh, German humiliation and so on, dancing the corridor and so on. But what we've missed, I think, is that uh, the 1930s ushered in a new age of imperialism and Hitler wanted to be part of that new age. So we go back to 1931 and the Japanese invasion of Manchuria. We go back to Mussolini and his invasion of Ethiopia. Both of these were about building a new empire in the 1930s, and nobody stopped them. The League of Nations did not stop the Japanese, the League of Nations did not stop the Italians, and nor did the great powers involved. For Hitler, by the late 1930s, it seemed clear that the possibility of building a German empire again in Eastern Europe was a real possibility. Now, it's worth emphasising, of course, that Hitler was not remotely interested in re-establishing German colonies overseas. This was part of the Versailles settlement that he could easily live with. He wanted empire, continental empire, in Eastern Europe. Now, he believed that the source of British and French power, the reason they won the First World War, was the fact that they had huge territorial empires, that this was really a source of their military and economic strength. Indeed, it's interesting that Hitler knew by heart uh, the territorial area, the number of square kilometres occupied by the British Empire, the French Empire, the Dutch Empire, the Belgian Empire. Um, and he was constantly aware that Germany did not possess an empire. Indeed, after the 1919 settlement, Germany was smaller than it had been before territorially. He also believed that the world was dividing up into economic blocks, that the global, globalisation of the economy, which had happened before 1914, was effectively over. That the British had their sterling area block, the French had their franc area block, the Americans had their dollar block in, uh, uh, in the New World, the Japanese were building a yen block in Eastern Asia. In other words, that the age of global economy was over. You were going to build... Uh, basically self-sufficient economic areas, blocks which you could dominate. Uh, and Hitler's uh, view was that that block would be established somewhere in Eastern Europe, even perhaps including eventually uh, conquest of the Soviet Union. And Poland would be part of that block. Uh, and Polish territory would be part of Germany's new empire. Now, there was a long tradition in Germany in thinking about Poland and the East, in inverted commas, as imperial, potential imperial territory. Uh, and Hitler was, I think, well aware of that long trajectory in German thinking about the East. So that when he finally had Poland in his sights, he wanted to turn Poland into colonial space. And I think that's a point which is worth stressing. We, we know all about the, the occupation policies, we know what happens when Germany conquers Poland, but, but we need to bear in mind that, that what Hitler, and indeed many German leaders, and indeed many German military leaders wanted, was at last a chance to turn Poland into colonial space. And indeed, that's what Hitler told his generals in May 1939. The issue, he said, is not Danzig at all, the issue is German living space. It is about developing German empire in Eastern Europe. Turning Poland into colonial space, as I've called it, of course, evolved other things as well. One of the things which happens in September 39 in Poland is that uh, the SS Einsatzgruppen these special units sent in behind the armed forces um, are supposed to be killing the Polish elite, politicians, cultural leaders, academics, clerics, and so on. These murder squads were there for a reason. They were there because what, what Hitler wanted was to eliminate Polish national life and Polish culture, to demodernize Poland, so you could turn it into something you would call colonial space because that elite was gone and all you would have less left would be Polish 
subjects. It has to be said that this is an aspect of the outbreak of war in September 39, which historians still grapple with, because the decision to send in the Einsatzgruppen to murder the Polish elite is extraordinary in the history of modern European war. Where does it come from, uh, this desire to behave atrociously against a conquered people? Unfortunately, of course, we don't have the conversations that Hitler and Himmler had about what they were going to do in Poland. These are precisely the kinds of things that would be discussed in private, no record. And so actually pinning down precisely when Hitler decided he was going to turn Poland into colonial space and what was required to do that is still elusive for historians. What is not elusive, of course, is the evidence. That's exactly what happened. They murdered tens of thousands of Poles. The uh, Polish elite was decimated uh, in the months after German victory. Resettlement plans meant kicking Poles out of their farms and homes and sending in German settlers. Um, it meant uh, the destruction of Polish education and culture, closing down the universities, saying that Poles could only go to school to a certain level. The whole programme uh, in Poland was about, as I've said, the imperial paradigm. At last, here was an area they could call empire, and they could treat the Poles as subjects. And that's exactly what they did. Poles had to get off the pavement when a German was walking past. They had to raise their hats uh, when a German soldier uh, passed them in the street. Uh, here was an imperial paradigm borrowed from 60 or 70 years of violent European imperialism outside Europe. This is how you could behave in Africa or the Middle East or in Asia. And here was Hitler saying you could behave like that in Europe as well. But what he did not want, I would argue, what he did not want was a simultaneous war with the West. What he hoped was that the West would simply give in, as they'd apparently done over the Munich crisis in September 1938. Now, many historians have argued the opposite, that he decided he would turn to the West, that now the West would become the enemy. He would finish the West first, and then he would turn to the East. But there simply is no evidence. You come through all the evidence available to us during the course of the spring and summer of 1939 in Germany, and there just is no evidence that Hitler wanted that war. He kept telling his generals and his uh, colleagues uh, that the war would be localised, and they kept saying, well, we're not so sure, and he would say, no, no, it will definitely be localised. Then we have the argument, of course, that economic pressure, in fact, changed his mind, that whether he liked it or not, he had to wage war against Britain and France because the German economy was facing a crisis, a financial crisis, a crisis of trade, a shortage of foreign currency, and so on and so on. But again, there's almost no evidence whatsoever that Hitler was influenced in his thinking about war by what was happening to the economy. Of course, there were economic motives, Poland would bring a great deal of agricultural land under German control. You would have the rich iron ore and coal resources. You would be able to embrace uh, the Polish economy into this broader German economic bloc. But that's different, of course, from saying that he was pressured into war against Britain and France because he was worried about uh, economic uh, his own economic problems. And indeed, making war on Britain and France would not make those economic problems easier, but worse. It would cut off uh, access to foreign currency even more. It would damage German trade uh, fundamentally because Britain and France would impose, of course, an immediate blockade. The argument that he went to war with Britain and France because his economic problems pushed him that way is an argument that persists, but it seems to me it has no real foundation. Now, of course, we all know that in March, the end of March 1939, uh, Britain and France gave a unilateral guarantee to Poland of Poland's sovereignty. Uh, this enraged Hitler, but it doesn't explain uh, his decision for war. That was governed much more by the implacable opposition of the Poles to making any concessions to the Germans across the winter and spring of 1939. 
Indeed, Hitler convinced himself throughout 39 that Britain and France would really not do very little. Uh, sorry, would not do very much. That they would make a lot of noise, that they would huff and puff and so on, they mobilised the League of Nations perhaps, but they wouldn't in the end obstruct his war with Poland. That this would be an act of will on his part. He had the will to wage war. The British and the French lacked the will to wage war. But just in case, he very famously, of course, made his pact on the 23rd of August, the anniversary is uh, tomorrow, of course, his pact on the 23rd of August with Stalin's Soviet Union in order to avoid any threat of Soviet intervention. Uh, but also, he hoped, of course, uh, to end any prospect that the British and French might interfere in his war with Poland. Indeed, the following day, he expected to hear news that the Chamberlain government had fallen in Britain as a result of the Nazi-Soviet pact. So convinced was he that he ordered the armed forces to begin preparations for a war against Poland to open on the 26th of August. We all know, of course, it didn't break out on the 26th of August. Uh, Britain ratified a treaty with Poland on August the 25th, and Hitler was momentarily taken aback, thought for, perhaps he misjudged what the British and French would do. But as it became clear that the British and French were also sending out feelers of one kind or another, diplomatic feelers of one kind or another, uh, he regained his composure. The following day, he ordered the army to prepare for war on the early morning of September the 1st, 1939, and he never wavered from that. He re remained convinced that in the end the British and French would back down, uh, that he would confront them effectively with a fait accompli. Uh, he would conquer Poland and there was nothing that they could do about it. And famously, as we all know, when news finally came through that Britain had declared war on the morning of September the 3rd, he was sitting with Ribbentrop, his foreign minister, uh, in the Chancellery, and he turned angrily to Ribbentrop and said, well, what now? Well, apocryphal or not, there's no doubt that for Hitler it was not what he wanted. He didn't want that. He wanted to be able to wage his short war against the Poles, establish German hegemony in Eastern Europe uh, and the British and French. Well, uh, he would deal with them perhaps later. Indeed, his uh, Comments to his generals suggested that he thought if there had to be a settlement with the West, it would come at some point in the mid-1940s, but not in 1939. Now, that, of course, raises a very important question. Why did Britain and France declare war? Now, the focus of much of the research of the last 10 years on the outbreak of war has shifted from looking at Germany and shifted back to looking at Britain and France, because that is, in fact, the question. Germany did not declare war on Britain and France. Britain and France declared war on Germany. Why did we do it? Neither state wanted war, wanted another world war again in the 1930s. They were also, we need to remind ourselves, no friend of Poland, indeed, for a long time, through 37, 38, even early 39, they assumed that the Poles really would gravitate into the German orbit, that they really would become uh, pro-German. They deeply distrusted the Poles, disliked the Poles' anti-Semitism um, and the authoritarian nature of uh, the Polish regime. Um, during the Munich crisis, as we know, the Poles took advantage of the crisis to seize some Czech territory themselves. So for the British and French, right up until the point where the guarantee was made in March 1939, Poland was a little bit outside uh, their radar. It was not a country that they felt particularly committed to. The guarantee itself, of course, was accidental. Following the German occupation of Prague, March the 15th, 1939, the British government panicked. The intelligence agencies fed through to Chamberlain news that the Germans might next be moving to Poland, uh, perhaps in a matter of weeks. There's still some debate about whether this was done intentionally by the British intelligence services, uh, mischievously, in fact, to firm Chamberlain up. But whatever the motive behind the intelligence reports, Chamberlain reacted immediately. He announced in the House of Commons a unilateral guarantee of Polish sovereignty. 
was followed by French guarantee, but also sovereignty, guarantee of the sovereignty of Romania and a number of other countries uh, as well, not just Poland. Now, this was an unpredictable crisis. The Poles themselves didn't really want the guarantee and not quite sure what it meant, whether this would actually be more dangerous for them than not having the guarantee, what, what effect it might have uh, on uh, Hitler and the German leadership. But for Britain and France, of course, the guarantee was not really about Poland. It was not about Poland as such, it was about putting down a marker to Hitler, saying that there were going to be no more occupations, no more Austria, no more Czechoslovakia. Um, the aim of the guarantee was not at Warsaw, the aim of the guarantee, of course, uh, was at Berlin. Now, German imperialism, like the imperialism of Italy and Japan that I talked about, in other words, the development of a, a new imperial, a new age of imperialism in the 1930s, it was very difficult for the British and the French to cope with. There were threats in Asia, there were threats in the Middle East and Africa, and now there were threats in Europe. Uh, what were they to do? Uh, their empires were unstable anyway. There were nationalist stirrings throughout the French and British Empire. Uh, the British and the French had had to act violently on numerous occasions in the 20s and 30s in their imperial area. Clearly, uh, exerting global power was becoming more and more difficult for Britain and France. But Italian, Japanese and German imperialism uh, was thought to be an even greater threat. This would accelerate the destabilisation of the British and French global imperial position. And that's really why they shifted in 1939 to the idea that you would have to confront Germany. Germany was the most dangerous of those three powers. You had to confront Germany, uh, and if you did so successfully, then you could rebuild a world order in which the British and French empires would once again be safe. We also need to remember that Britain and France both began their rearmament a considerable time before 1939. It's often argued that everything was done too late. They did it in the big rush in 39, and it's too late uh, to stop Hitler. But in fact, British and French rearmament had begun, well, it began in the, in the period after Hitler came to power, but it accelerated in 36 with big rearmament programs put forward by both countries due to reach fruition 1939-1940. So that if you had to confront German power, for both Britain and France, 39-40 was a good time to do it because rearmament was up and running. Very soon, uh, their rearmament would outstrip, between them, would outstrip uh, German war production. Growing confidence, in other words, in 1939, that if you had to obstruct Germany, if you had to put down a marker, if you wanted to save the existing global system, that this perhaps was the point to do it. But also very critical was a change in British and French public attitudes to war. Now we need to remind ourselves that for most of the 1930s there was a strong anti-war movement uh, in both countries. Not necessarily pacifist, but anti-war. They're not necessarily the same thing. Uh, a mass anti-war movement in Britain, more than a million, million and a half people in various organisations, um, uh, affiliated to various organisations which were anti-war, no more war. Large pacifist movement too, which is completely opposed to the idea uh, that Britain would ever go to war again. But in 1939, the anti-war lobby began to change its view, began to argue that the only way, in fact, to outlaw war was more war that there would be no alternative really now to having a war with Germany because Germany posed a mortal threat, um, a mortal threat in the end to the idea of European civil and world civilization. And if that was the case, with resignation, you had to accept war uh, with Germany. And after that, you could set about uh, putting the world to rights again. 
Um, and this was a shift in attitude which you can chart very easily across the course of 1938-1939. A prominent pacifist in both countries uh, came away from their pacifism and said that because of Hitler, they would have to embrace the idea of unnecessary violence. Now, what kind of violence would there be? Now, I said Britain and France were not particularly interested in Poland. And it's worth emphasising that they began war planning in March 1939, uh, even before they'd made the guarantee. And Germany, of course, was the war uh, that they were planning for. And the Allied war plan was based really on the experience of the First World War. They expected there to be a three-year war of attrition, but Germany would somehow be bottled up um, by the Maginot Line in France, by uh, a, a defensive line somewhere across uh, northeastern France. Um, the German economy was fragile and therefore allied economic warfare would wear down the German economy uh, and the capacity to continue uh, making war. And then Germany would be bombed, bombed heavily, um, and the bombing too uh, would bring Hitler and the German people to their senses. They would then restore an independent Poland after their three-year war was over. A repeat, not this time of 1914-18, but a repeat of 1919. Uh, both Britain and France were curiously locked into their memories of the First World War. Now, we might say that that was short-sighted. It was indeed short-sighted, but it's extraordinary when you go through the planning documents from this period, on into 1940 as well. They were confident that Germany could be defeated, that Germany would be bottled up, and that their three-year programme for war uh, was the right one. But they also hoped, of course, that Hitler would be deterred, as he'd been, they thought, in 1938. Indeed, for the British and the French, despite everything we know about the Munich Conference and our view that this was a, uh, a, a, an abdication by the Western powers of their responsibility. The West saw this as an act of deterrence, that Hitler didn't have his war against the Czechs. He got the Sudetenland, uh, but he didn't get his war with the Czechs. And in 1939, he might be deterred again. They might, in the end, have to give him Danzig to keep him quiet, but he could be deterred again, that he would back down. Now, the British and French intelligence services provided a stream of material throughout the summer of 1939 to convince the French and British government that this really was realistic. Uh, they highlighted all the economic problems. They kept searching for evidence of popular unrest inside Germany. Every time they got a snippet of news, they blew it up into potential revolutionary crisis. So that their conviction that Hitler might be deterred if they stood firm was based on intelligence that we now know, of course, is entirely erroneous. Um, if it was not possible to deter him, then, of course, they were prepared to embrace world war. Now, these two convictions collided in the summer of 1959. Hitler's conviction that the West would back down, the British and French conviction that Hitler was bluffing, and if you just stood up to him, it would deter him from waging war. And we know, of course, what the consequence was of that collision of convictions. Now, for Hitler, of course, the Polish war fitted really with what he wanted. He got what he wanted. He got his little war, a very successful little war, all over in four weeks. Um, he got colonial space. He got a large slice of new empire, better than the Czech Austrian states he'd already absorbed. Um, Poland was a, a, a potential source of agricultural wealth, mineral resources, and of course a subject population that could be forced into labour for the Third Reich. He also got what he wanted with the destruction of the Polish elite. Operation Tannenberg, as it was called, was unleashed immediately. The Einsatzgruppen followed the army into Poland, killing people as they went, and carried on killing over the months that followed. 
For what he did not want, as I've said, was world war. And if you're at war with Britain and France, it is a world war. World war, because Britain, a, a war with Britain means a war with Australia, with Canada, with South Africa, with India. Or with France means a war with France's extensive empire. And both the British and the French governments emphasised that, that they were not alone. They were waging war uh, with their empires. This was world war. Now, world war needed more explanation. German propaganda throughout the summer of 39 had been directed at the Poles, that the Poles deserved what they were going to get, that the Poles behaved atrociously towards the German minority, and so on and so on. This was something you could explain to the German public reasonably well. But explaining to them why Hitler had misjudged the mood of Britain and France and plunged Germany once again into world war was more difficult. We all know that when news of war came, the German public did not leap about, wave flags, it was the opposite. They all slunk home, uh, depressed at the prospect that they were going to face a second world war again in a generation. So how was it explained? Well, Hitler blamed the Jews. Now, blaming the Jews for things, of course, uh, in the Third Reich had quite a long history. But I think it's very important from our point of view to recognise that the outbreak of war with Britain and France in September 39 was the point at which Hitler moved together his military and strategic thinking and his anti-Semitism that the only way you could actually explain why Germany was now facing world war was to blame the Jews. Well, first of all, of course, we know that on January 30th, 1939, the anniversary of the, German, of the Nazi seizure of power, he had already made his famous threat that if the Jews ever dragged Germany again into a global war, they would be the ones to suffer. So already... Uh, Months before the outbreak of war, Hitler had connected these two things together, the prospect of war uh, and his war against the Jews. Now, historians have not taken that declaration very seriously, but I think we do need to take it very seriously. Two years later, when the United States was clearly siding with Britain uh, and then finally declared war on Germany, was the point at which Hitler unleashed the genocide, convinced that the reason the United States was at war with Germany was because the Jews had pushed Roosevelt into war. But the start was the war with Poland. On September the 4th, he made a radio broadcast to the German people. Why are Britain and France declaring war? He said it's because of a Jewish democratic uh, international enemy. Uh, a propaganda trope which continues really throughout the rest of the Second World War. From the start, in Hitler's mind, the Jews were to blame. Now, Polish Jews, of course, suffered immediately as a result of the German victory and occupation. Uh, forced labour programmes, pushed into ghettos, deportation, expropriation of Jewish wealth, and so on. There was no room for Jews in Hitler's colonial space. Uh, and as Hitler's empire expanded into Eastern Europe with the invasion of the Soviet Union, that became more and more explicit. The Jews, as a result of the war uh, uh, in September 39, became increasingly vulnerable and isolated. It's also worth reminding ourselves, and I think we often do forget, of course, that the other uh, um, uh, victor nation in September 39 was the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, on September the 17th, also invaded Poland, occupied the eastern part, under the terms more or less agreed in the Nazi-Soviet Pact of August the 23rd. And it's worth reminding ourselves again um, that the Soviet Union, too, had a policy about Jews. Indeed, for the first two years uh, of Soviet occupation of eastern Poland, Jews suffered probably more under the Soviet Union than they did under Germany. The Soviet Union rounded Jews up, sent them to the Gulag, uh, murdered rabbis, closed down synagogues, um, uh, outlawed uh, the Jewish Sabbath, and so on and so on. Um, but the majority of Jews living in eastern Poland 
which was the area of the old Tsarist Pale of Settlement, uh, a very large Jewish community in eastern Poland, uh, was raked over by the Soviet Union in two years of occupation between 39 and 41. So as Jews in Poland, whether you lived in the western German-occupied part or you lived in the Soviet eastern-occupied part, you were going to be victimised by one, totalita by one totalita totalitarian regime or another. Now, a question that's often asked, of course, is could the war have been averted? Well, there's an extreme version, of course, which is that, um, that, that Britain and France just abandoned the Poles, nothing they could do to help them. Um, they couldn't do much for Poland in 1945, so why didn't they just give it up in 1939? But there are other factors that we might consider. If the Poles had given in, there would not have been war, certainly not on that scale. If they'd given Hitler what he'd demanded in the spring of 39. But the Polish government knew that if you gave that, gave that away in March 39, you would give a great deal more away. You would give away Poland's independence in the end. Uh, and it was unlikely that any Polish regime would accept that in 1939. Well, if the West had just appeased and not guaranteed Poland, well, that's possible, of course. But by that stage, there was strong sentiment, both at government level and at public level, uh, against uh, further concessions to Hitler uh, and against accepting uh, continued German expansion in Eastern Europe. If the Soviet Union um, had stood up and said, you're not going to do anything else, you're not going to invade Poland, we're going to oppose you, uh, would that have made a difference? Well, it's sometimes argued that it would have been. But we, we need to understand Stalin's view in uh, 1939. He played with the British and French, saying, let's have a military alliance, let's encircle Germany, and so on and so on. But it's almost certainly did not want that. He didn't want the risk of war for the Soviet Union. And indeed, uh, the Nazi-Soviet pact fulfilled almost everything that Stalin wanted. Put him in a position um, where he was not going to be involved in war and where he could begin to extend Soviet power uh, into Eastern Europe uh, without facing opposition from the West. Well, the only thing really, of course, that would have stopped war in September 39 is if Hitler had backed down. On September the 1st, Chamberlain sent him um, uh, an ultimatum, a semi-ultimatum, saying that you have to withdraw your troops from Poland. Um, he didn't, because he thought that in the end the British and the French were bluffing. But there was no possibility that Hitler uh, would withdraw in September 1939. He was committed to the idea of war and committed to the idea now that he could build this new German empire. All those involved were locked into a collision course in September 1939 for different reasons. The room for manoeuvre largely disappeared. German imperialism was too important for Hitler and too threatening for the West. Now, are there any lessons we might learn today, 80 years on from what happened in September 1939. Well, I'm often asked by journalists that uh, can we expect World War III in the near future? Uh, and I, I generally um, play them down a bit. Um, but there's a great deal of talk now about, you know, is there going to be a new world war? Well, I think there won't be a world war, and there certainly won't be a world war anything like the war that broke out in 1939. But in Poland, there is growing anxiety about Polish security. They look at Putin's Russia and the possibility of growing Russian domination, perhaps again, in Eastern Europe. They worry that NATO may leave them in the lurch, particularly with Trump, whose views of NATO responsibilities are increasingly uh, ambivalent. Polish security seemed clear in the 1990s. It seems much less clear now. But I think it's very important to stress that history doesn't repeat itself. However much Poles may fear their position today, and you can see why it's embedded in their history, 
of the last uh, century. Uh, it's embedded in their history. Uh, but the age of territorial imperialism, of which they were a victim in the 1930s, is long gone. It's not going to happen again, and certainly not going to happen in that form. Sadly, the only thing that we can say about the crisis in 1939 unleashed by Hitler, of course, is that anti-Semitism, irrational fantasies about the Jews, about Jewish power, about Jewish culture, about the extent to which Jews undermine um, existing states, has not disappeared. Um, and in some cases seems to be, once again, in the ascendant. So this is one lesson we need to learn from 1939. It is that fantasies about Jewish um, power, fantasies which fuel this anti-Semitism, have to be contested all the time, and they still have to be contested 80 years later. Sadly, despite German defeat in 1945, the spectre of anti-Semitism is still with us today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much for your, for your lecture. Uh, I was wondering if, if I could uh, take advantage, uh, advantage of my position and ask the first question. And, and you, uh, are we having a discussion? Uh, yes, in a minute. We will, mm. we will yes. Uh, you have basically been talking about the great powers, but there were also a lot of smaller countries spinning in the orbit, the European orbit. Yeah. So, could you say something about how the great powers were thinking about, for example, the northern neutrals, the, the low countries, the, the Nordic countries? Uh, uh, and I'm asking because war came to Finland in late November mm. 1939 mm. and to Denmark in Norway in, mm. in April uh, 1940. So uh, uh, could you say something about the considerations uh, and, 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 and what countries like uh, uh, Britain, France, Germany, even Russia, the Soviet Union, mm. were thinking about uh, the role and the mm. importance of the sm smaller countries in, in Europe. Mm. Well, I think they hadn't thought a great deal about it. Um, the British and French um, privately, I mean, they guaranteed Poland, Romania, and Greece, um, so on, but they, uh, but they also privately had a kind of map in their mental map in which they would protect Belgium, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Romania, and so on. But uh, the Nordic countries didn't feature particularly on, uh, on, on that map. And it certainly didn't feature on uh, a German map because Hitler hadn't expected it to, to become World War, but he would have to start thinking about you know, what was going to be uh, the problem on his, uh, on his northern flank and so on, what would be the problem in the Balkans. Um, I think for, for a, 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 a long time, um, Hitler's, Hitler's vision and that of those around him had focused very much on Eastern Europe and perhaps some eventual war with the Soviet Union. Um, but smaller states didn't feature um, a great deal. Uh, and they're, they're, they're plunged into war in 1940 because of the circumstances of World War, because of the war that's declared by Britain and France in, in 1939. Mm. Okay, thank you.